We are on. Okay, so remember where we've been. Last week we were uh, with. Uh, spent some time talking about Walther. Last week, talking about kind of all these church bodies that all of a sudden um, pop up. Um, where did all the Lutherans in America come from? Germany. Germany. So, how'd they get here? Germany, right? Yeah, why are you sitting over there? Germany. You should sit like over here. How did they get here? Uh, they got here because the Germans are immigrating to this country, and uh, a great many of them are Lutheran, and so um, where did they move to? They're moving to, they're not moving really to the hot places. Um, no. They stick to the Midwest, mm -hmm. uh, they stick to the um, Northeast, um, kind of upstate New York. Um, Yeah, I mean, they're they're basically kind of staying in the top of the country. They're not they're not moving to places like Alabama, really. Okay, um, because well, I mean, I don't know. I imagine that if you're a people from Germany moving somewhere, you're going to try and find somewhere that kind of looks a little bit like Germany. Germany. Yeah. Um, so all the the Finns, uh, the Scandinavians, do the same thing. They move to the upper Midwest, very similar climate to uh, what's going on there. So, well, and the Scandinavians are all Lutherans too. Do you know that? They're all Lutherans, right? Yeah. So, because in Scandinavia, they've actually got a state church too. Um, so, the official religion, the official religion of uh, Denmark, of Norway, of Finland, of Sweden, and Iceland is Lutheran. So, their official religion. Yeah. So, um, Adolphus Gustus? Uh, Gustavus Adolphus. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Gustavus Adolphus. I don't quite understand who he did, but he was a Swedish king. Yeah, well, he protected the Reformation. He protected the Reformation. Fought off the Catholics, I think. I don't know. Yeah. They were, they were killing. Yeah. He came in. Yeah. Kid was. Yeah. So, um, yeah, basically, due to all the immigration in the country, we have Lutherans settling um, kind of all over the place. So they're starting, they're starting their own churches, they're starting their own um, synods, their own sort of denominations and whatnot, and uh, they're they're all over the place. And so eventually, they all start talking to each other, saying, um, "Well, by the way, what is the point of having a denomination?" Anyways, why do we belong to a, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod? So that we worship in fellowship with those that are in common belief. A fellowship thing? Yeah. Fellowship? Yeah, what else? Why? What's the point of having a denomination? Is there an advantage to having a denomination? So we have fellowship with other people. Clarification of doctrine. Uh, doctrinal stuff. You can get really good insurance that way. I know. <laughs> yeah, some people say that uh, our insurance and retirement plan is the only thing holding our church together still. Um, but, uh, yeah, so there's things like that. Uh, there's yeah, also... When you go to seminary, that everybody's yeah. learning the same thing. Yeah, very good. Exactly. So, basically, so I have a friend who is, um, he just accepted a call in um, Topeka, Kansas. He, was a, he went to a Southern Baptist seminary and planted a non-denominational church that didn't baptize babies in Wilmington, North Carolina, which is like paradise. And he was the pastor there for 17 years. He had some conflicts with the church and, um, and he kind of realized that he's a non-denominational pastor and he is all on his own. And he did not have anyone to help him. And so he was like, oh, I, I need to be a part of a denomination uh, for my protection, also for the protection of a congregation, too. Uh, and so he started looking around, and uh, he found the Book of Concord and was like, 
oh, that's it. Um, and so he joined our, he joined the Missouri Synod and, and uh, just accepted a, his first call with us in Topeka, Kansas, and uh, lived all his life in North Carolina, too. His whole family is from North Carolina, his wife's family, and now they're going to Kansas. So. That's not Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I kind of, not that I have any power to like, call people up here, but I did kind of float it by and I was like, Devin, you know, there's a lot of vacancies up here. And there are kind of, so Fairbanks is going to be calling soon, probably, and uh, Beautiful yeah. Savior, and, and uh, do we know if Andy took that Florida call? Still waiting. Still waiting, okay. We've got to make a decision over the weekend. Well, you can take... Uh, People have taken longer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of calls up here, and Kenai is going to be calling, so I was like, hey. But um, Kansas, Kansas, wow. I, I cannot imagine what it would be like to just have been from North Carolina your whole entire life and then, then like, move to Kansas. Yeah, but a prop is not respected in his own country. Well, exactly, and it's actually, it's a good thing for them, too. But, um, so there's, yeah, the point of having denomination, too, so um, you have an association of pastors, and then, so what happens when I die or leave this church? How do you get a new pastor? Well, you've got this pool of pastors, and you find a guy, and you uh, know what this guy believes, and ideally, any pastor in our synod should be able to serve at any church in our synod. Like, that's the way it's supposed to work. This is good stuff, okay? So, um, a non-denom church, non-denominational church, what do they do when their pastor dies? Uh, pull the committee. And, and, it, and so then what? They just kind of find guys, interview them, and they might not believe the same thing the last guy did. And they might come in and teach something kind of totally different. But hey, if they like the way he speaks, then that's fine. And um, my... A lot of my wife's family goes to this church out in uh, Nikiski because it's the closest church to where they live, I think. But it's a non-denominational church. And it's, every time they get a new pastor, it kind of, the, what they're doing really shifts around. And like one time they, um, they, they were into like waving banners a lot. And then they go through like tongue speaking phases. And it's, it just kind of, changes all the time so what we actually want is for your church to be kind of insulated from something like that so if i came in here and i was like look guys here's what we got to do here's what the holy spirit told me laid on my heart you have to say that by the way when people say that the holy spirit laid something on their heart uh run yeah, run away, and it's really not much justification for like doing whatever you think the Holy Spirit told you to do. Normally, it's just like, I want to do this and think it's a good idea, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know. Just say that. Um, but uh, it's like I can't say that the Holy Spirit laid it on my heart that we should change the font on the, the bulletin, because God has nowhere promised that the Holy Spirit will come to you and dictate which um, you should be using Courier New Size 12 instead of Times New Roman Size 12. So um, it doesn't work like that. But anyways, yeah, so they start looking around and they start forming their own churches, their synods. Uh, by the way, synod, uh, another strange word. I mean, our church body has like the weirdest name in the world, the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod. I mean, so Missouri is kind of strange because we're not anywhere near that state. It's actually the Ohio River and Missouri. Yeah, so, well, it was really uh, Missouri, Ohio, and other states. And yeah. it's like, okay, other states. Which, they, I think they had churches from six states when they were founded. But, Sounds about right. Um, six states? Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, six Missouri. Six Ohio. Ohio. But, um, maybe in Iowa. Iowa, perhaps, yeah. But uh, there's other things you can do when you have a denomination because the thing is that, like, we're actually, uh, we're, we do really good things all together. So on our own, on our own, could we send 
hundreds of missionaries around the world to do stuff? Yeah. No. No. Uh, if we get together with a couple thousand other churches, could we send missionaries around the world to do stuff? Yeah. And then we can have seminaries, and we can have um, office buildings, and six-figure salary executives, too. But there's a lot of baggage that comes along with being a part of a, de of a denomination. But it's there for your good, okay? It's there for the good of the congregation. It's there for the good of, uh, of the, the pastors that are a part of it. So, our, uh, the Lutheran Missouri Synod, we have this kind of long-standing thing where we're saying, all right, so we subscribe to the Book of Concord on a quia basis. Does anyone remember what this distinction is? Quia or quatanus? Quia or quatanus? Does anyone remember what this was from last week? Super important. Okay, so quia, we subscribe to the Book of Concord because it agrees with the Word of God. Quatanus, we subscribe to the Book of Concord in as much as it agrees with the Word of God. And what's the difference there? Basically, you're saying, if I think it agrees, then I can agree with it. But what we say, a little soon for that, but, uh, uh, man, but uh, it's, yeah, um, yeah, we subscribe because it agrees with the word of God. So uh, anything in the book of Concord, you can come and be like, we can think on your own. Like, I wonder what my pastor believes about this thing or that thing. And well, you look it up and then you will know. And I won't say like, well, I don't really buy that because that's not really in the word of God. Okay. This is actually what it means to be a confessional church, okay? So there are confessional Lutherans. That just means that we care about the Book of Concord. There are confessional Presbyterians. There are other sorts of confessional Christians, too. It just means that we have everything written down, what you believe, in a book. And you can look and see what the dude believes. You don't have to worry about what the Spirit laid on his heart that week, okay? That's good for you, okay? Yeah. Got it? Okay, so, we have. Uh, so the title of today's segment is the post-frontier era. So basically what we've seen is that they get dropped off in America and they are answering all these new questions. They have all these scenarios that the church has never ever had to face. And so they're having to figure out how to do it. It's kind of, they're doing theology uh, as they go. Because there's no instructions for what to do when, you're, uh, when you have started a colony in Missouri, how exactly you go about having a church there. Especially when you don't have a bishop anymore, and they're like, what do we do? There's no state church over them, there's no one, no one is making the rules for them anymore. So they're figuring it all out. And so, um, which is kind of, by the way, what exactly how... The history of our church very closely um, mirrors or goes along with the history of our country. Well, there's never been a country like this ever in the whole entire world. I mean, how many constitutional democracies were there before <coughs> our country was founded? There were none. I mean, you had like kind of Rome and Greece sort of stuff 2,000 years ago. But by and large, we came to this country and everyone is having to figure it out how to do brand new things of having uh, governments in, in churches. So, um, so we're going to get into the 20th century here where things stop being, we're just kind of making it up as we go. Okay. Now, when you make things up as you go, it actually helps to be a confessional Lutheran because like, you, have, you have a book that will tell you if you're doing the right or the wrong thing. Okay. So, um, very, very helpful. So, post-frontier. So here's the kind of defining things that we have seen so far in the history of our church. So, after the Thirty Years' War, this massively destructive war in, in Europe, mostly in Germany, between Catholics and Protestants, basically. Uh, after that, everyone gets out and they say, we don't need to have doctrine anymore. Too many people got killed over doctrine, so we don't care about it, all right? Either it's pietism, which is all what's in your heart, doing good stuff, or it's rationalism, which is doctrine doesn't matter because it's not real, okay? Because um, remember the father of, of uh, the father of rationalism is Descartes, and so uh, his thing is I think, therefore I am, 
Right? So I am the Lord of my life. I, 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 I. So uh, before that, it just been about God, but then it turns into who's at the center of everything? I am. Okay? So it's actually, they have a, this is a wonderful German phrase, ich theology. So I theology. Theology of the me, of the I. Okay? So then we also have this question of quia or quartanus that's coming along. Right? And, and basically what we're asking is, what role do the Holy Scriptures have in the life of the church? And um, very closely related to that is, what role do the Lutheran confessions have in the life of the church? And, um, and we come down and say that they have everything to do with the life of the church. Okay? So, we cannot be just making stuff up. All right? So, how do we like, do our theology? Well, is it in the Bible? And if, it's in, if we think it's in the Bible, has anyone ever believed this before us? Okay. So, can you, find, can you find Augustine talking about the same stuff? Can you find any of the other church fathers talking about this stuff? Did Luther talk about this stuff? Right? Did the guys real close to Luther believe this stuff? And if they, if, if they all kind of went on that train, then we're, we're on the right path. Okay. So, uh, and that's, that's basically how we use um, the scriptures. So, uh, Either the scriptures are the authority over us, or we are the authority over the scriptures. Does that make sense? Uh, so, the European Lutherans are they a little bit of both, Pietist and rationalist? But yeah, they're, yeah, they're totally. Yeah, and that's why our people kind of left. We're, so um, our people leave over the hymnal, basically, that was forced upon them that uh, was Calvinist and, and basically over the denial of the Lord's real presence in the Lord's Supper. So, they say, well, of course we, why do we believe that Jesus is actually present in the Lord's Supper? He said so. Did he? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So he says, this is my body. Okay. This is my blood. Very good. Okay. So, that's all we got. That's all we got, guys. And uh, we better take Jesus at his word. Okay. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you believe that Jesus' body and blood is actually in the Lord's Supper? Why wouldn't you believe that? Rationalism. Because you're a rationalist. Because you can't see it. Because it doesn't look like body and blood. Okay. But we submit our reason, our rationalism... We submit that to the word of Jesus. So, um, and why do we believe the word of Jesus? But this is there's really like kind of one reason why you should believe Jesus when he says anything. He's God. <laughs> he's God. How do we know he's God? The Bible tells us so. And what does the Bible tell us about why Jesus is God? It was cool. It was in the uh, it was in the epistle reading at Matins today. Divinity of Jesus. Prove it, real real quick. Because um, he works miracles. Miracles. Okay. Ah, that could be made up stuff. What else? God, God said he was. God said he was. I don't believe in God. Tell me more. Resurrection. Oh yeah, resurrection. Okay. okay. Resurrection from the dead. It's like the one thing we've got. And if that didn't happen, then none of the other stuff matters, okay? The dude is raised from the dead, okay? So, uh, we should believe, kind of, we should take seriously a lot of the things that he has to say. If he's raised from the dead, first guy ever who is raised from the dead, never to die again. All right, yeah, so that's the thing that I'm going to base everything else on, Okay. That is that is the linchpin of the whole entire thing. Okay, pull that out, you got nothing. If Christ is not raised from the dead, then you're still in your your sins and trespasses, and this is all a waste of time. All right. So, uh, yeah, that's why we care about what says that it's not true that we are just a miserable lot, miserable, and to be pitied above all people. Well, we'll but if he is. Luther, Luther says this thing, he says, like, wow, but, you know, but Christ is raised from, from the dead, so um, we, uh, like, oh, we should just dance through life, because this is true. You a good dancer? No. 
Um, did you use Complutense and Polyglot mm -hmm. yet? Nope. You didn't Sorry. use that at camp? Uh, yeah. Oh, man. At uh, orchestra camp, that seems like it'd be popular. Yeah. The Complutense and Polyglot was this Bible that's put together in, in uh, many languages, what it is. And it's, uh, it was produced in Spain, actually, I think. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's Latin, Hebrew, Greek, um, and then Spanish, I believe. So, yeah. Oldest multiple language version of the Bible ever. Cool stuff. It's huge, too. It's just gigantic. Um, all right, so there is this other stream, the enthusiasts or the schwammeri. This is, and I've called this the unfortunate children of the Reformation. Um, so the guy on the left is Thomas Munzer. He's from Zwickau. Uh, and so they're called the Zwickau prophets, these guys who go around basically telling you that uh, you cannot rely on objective things like words and sacrament. Okay? All that matters really is the stuff in your heart. And so they're, they're kind of related to the pietists. It's not exactly the same thing. Does anyone know who the good looking guy is? Uh, that is Charles Finney. Charles Finney. Charles Finney. Anyone ever heard of Charles Finney? Is he on a stamp? That does look like a stamp. I don't quite understand what it is, but... Um, so Charles Finney was a guy... Uh, he's born in 1792, and he lives to 1875. So there's a... Have you heard... So there's a thing called the First Great Awakening. The Great Awakening, Jonathan Edwards was this... Uh, Puritan preacher, real fire brimstone stuff, and kind of shook people out of their denominational malaise, all right? Because what happens is that you, uh, if you spend too much time in a, in a denominational church, you get lazy, and so these guys come along, and everyone's willing to shake you up, and they say, hey, wake up, you got to get out of that established institution church. And is, is this the upstate New York? Yes, bunch? so this is what is going on here. So the second Great Awakening is uh, 1825, 1835, um, and what you have here, this is the birth of the Big Tent Revival, okay? So Charles Finney goes around. Has anyone ever been to a revival at a tent? Yes. I've seen one. Yes. Yes. They, I mean, they I've have been to a Chiquacqua, too. Oh. Which is? It's like a summer-long entertainment Christian... Bible study, they, they're, they're all up and down Lake Michigan. Huh. Yeah, I am. Um, Northern Wisconsin. I'm, I've never been to a tent revival, but... Really, um, like a summer camp for adults. Oh. That's what adults need to do. Alaska's like a summer camp for adults. But, uh, Until it comes to winter. Are you going to try and get Chad to do that? No. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, this is where the tent revival comes from. It's this idea you got to go around and get people to be real Christians, okay? Uh, he is, um, now Charles Finney, he's ordained a Presbyterian minister, but he becomes very suspicious of Presbyterianism, rejects the sacraments, rejects any of this objective stuff, and it's all about Christian perfectionism is what it's called. And so they've got this thing in the tents when this guy's preaching. Now, this guy's huge, too. He's... He's like 6'6", six, six, and uh, like, I think people that are 6'6", six, six, that's a pretty good height. Because it's not absurdly tall, but it's like, it's still like, could knock you down really quick. Tall? You know, they, they're not too tall. And, uh, and apparently people talked about his glare a lot. And it looks like he worked on that probably, but <laughs> that was going to get you. Um, and so he preaches these very law-based sermons. And they have this thing in the front called the anxious bench. Has anyone ever heard of this? Okay. Has anyone ever heard of um, holy rollers? Yeah. So holy roller. This is a term that comes from this time. Um, so people would sit in the front and supposedly sway back and forth. People that aren't quite sure they want to be on board with Christianity sit in the front in the anxious bench. And... Um, and then, once they've decided to give their hearts to Jesus, then, you know, they come up and 
do whatever it takes to give your heart to Jesus, um, which I have never done, and I don't know quite how it works. So, and that's a fantastic thing about being Lutheran. I don't, I never gave my heart to Jesus. I mean, He took it a long, long time ago, but I've never been like, "Cut off my heart." No, this is not how it works. Um, so yeah, this is another thing that is kind of running alongside, um, running alongside all these Lutherans who are settling. We're also being subject to these guys coming around with big tent revivals. And, you know, guess what? The curious thing about us is that we always try and, like, do what the other guys are doing. And so, uh, yeah. There were a lot of Lutheran churches that had revivals in North Carolina. I said, really? You're having a revival? Because here's what a revival is. When you have a revival, what you're assuming, what you're saying, what you're telling those people is that they don't actually have the Holy Spirit. If you have to revive someone, what are they? Dead. dead. They're dead. You're they're telling them that they are dead, they have a dead faith, they're everything. They're unconscious. Yeah. <laughs> and you got to get them back. And that's what they're trying to do. They're, they're trying to shock the people back in, into being believers. There have been two other great awakenings since then, too. One is from 1960 to 1980, which is where you have like the Azusa Street Revival, and you have the birth of uh, this kind of new Pentecostalism that comes out. And, surprise, surprise, a lot of the Lutherans went along with this, and um, we have a handful of charismatic Pentecostal Lutheran churches still. Did you know that? It's a big thing. Big thing in the, in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And in fact, still, when you... So when you call a pastor, you get our like information. It's called a set, the self-evaluation tool. It's real long. You have to write down all your answers to all these things. And there's a question on it that says, what is your opinion on the um, charismatic movement? And it's like, I don't know. I, it's dumb. I don't know. Is that acceptable? Well, you can't just write that. Can you? Can you? Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, I certainly don't deny the gifts of speaking in tongues. It's obviously in the Bible. It's obviously happened. And I've, uh, you know, but I don't think that what most people do today counts as biblical Holy Spirit gifts speaking in tongues. Okay? But... Uh, it, was, it was about that time that... that the Finnish Lutheran Church broke up, and the, the whole church was in Ironwood. And that was the distinction between oh, sure. who went to Missouri Synod and, and who went to, to EL, uh, ELA. Because the, the Pentecostal leaning ones, they went to, to ELA. And uh, oh, sure. the rest yeah. of them started signing. And they're going to be real, they're going to be a lot more kind of. Tolerant of things like that. So, um, honestly, I don't think the Lutheran confessions have a position on speaking in tongues because no one was doing it 500 years ago. Uh, all right. So, watch out for these guys. Scary. Because in the whole th enthusiasm, it's, the word itself is just like looking inside yourself, okay? And again, what do you find when you look inside yourself? Death. Sin. Bad. Darkness. Evil. Evil? Evil. Evil. Evil, 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 evil. Very good. Exactly. Um, so that's what you find when you look inside. Don't look inside yourself. Where do you look? You look outside yourself. Okay? Uh, so, what we have is this... All these churches have been having these conversations back and forth. They've been having these things called free conferences where they'll go and they'll send their scholars and pastors to go and present issues and talk about things. And they've been doing this for decades. And eventually, in 1872, we were like, all right... We are going to just declare fellowship with the Wisconsin Synod, with the Evangelical Lutheran Synod. So these, the Evangelical Lutheran Synod, they're more, like, they're more uh, Scandinavians. But Wisconsin Synod is Germans who settled largely in Wisconsin. Yeah, so 
Uh, Missouri Synod, we're kind of all over the place, but Wisconsin, really, there are a lot more than Wisconsin mm -hmm. than anywhere else. Um, so we found this thing. It, uh, this church is St. John Lutheran Church in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It's actually, it's the, it's so, has anyone ever been to Milwaukee and gone to our churches there? Have you? <laughs> yes. Have you been to this one? Uh, maybe. It's, uh, have you been to Historic Trinity? I don't think so. But we have cool churches there. What we know is that the Catholics build cool, cool big buildings, especially in Europe. But once our people got to, like, Wisconsin, they built these just magnificent churches. Just really cool places. Um, and this church has, like, seven people left at it now. Yeah. Well, you know, there are advantages to that, but uh, Holy Cross and Saginaw is the same situation. That was that was a a charter congregation. Yeah, it's a it's a scary thing. But your, your spider's only as big as the one on this side. That's oh, the yeah, ones. yeah. Um, so yeah, we have these wonderful churches there. But so, anyways, uh, St. John's Lutheran Church in Milwaukee was where the Synodical Conference was founded. So, and what is that? So, uh, the Missouri Synod gets together with these other church bodies, and we say, "Hey, we all believe the same thing. We're going to work together. We're going to be in full fellowship." Okay. Is that St. John's? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then I have um, I would do a St. John's for the front of the body. Not... In Milwaukee. Probably a Welsh church. We probably have one, too. <laughs> I don't know. But this is a Welsh church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. It was built kind of when electricity was just starting to be a thing. And so there's, like, the whole entire thing is just lined with light bulbs. It's crazy. Um, yeah. Like, imagine a light bulb every six inches on every single rafter. I think that's what it is. But, um, uh, so we're kind of, we're, we're getting out of the period where we're figuring out what's going on. We're free, and, but, and now we're like actually kind of taking sides. The teams are, we've been picking teams and we're getting down to like picking the last guys. And they're, it's time to play kickball now. Okay. And that's where we're at during this time. And this is what we do. So the Sinatra Conference is a fantastic thing. Um, because we got a lot done with it. Um, my old church uh, in North Carolina was started by the Synodical Conference. Um, a very interesting thing that they did. So when you think of a Lutheran, what do you think of? What do you think they look like? A white European. Yeah, a white European. So, um, and eventually, they're like, all right, so why is it that most Lutherans are white Europeans? I mean, do we think that the Lutheran doctrine is uh, really kind of only applicable to white people living in the suburbs? I, I don't think so for one second. Uh, and so what they did, they sent a bunch of missionaries to the South to start all these churches, these black churches, basically. And, and uh, it's a really cool thing. And, and many, many, many of them are still there. And, um, and I came from one of them. And uh, there's... It's like maybe a dozen of them in North Carolina, and and, uh, and no one knows the Black Lutherans exist. And the and people yet, there would. And yet, some of the first missionary work by the, the church in Germany was done in Africa, hmm. and it was only due to the lack of German colonies hmm. in Africa, being the French and the British beat us there in many many cases, uh, but Ethiopia. Uh, the southern Sudan, uh, yeah, yeah, the Uganda area. Uh, they they were in, in Tanganyika. Uh, they were they were heavily Lutheran. Uh, Togo on the on the western side. Mm -hmm. they, they, those were all Lutheran uh, countries over there. What until we've seen they were taken away from Germany. Yeah, what we've seen recently. So um, the Norwegians had a ton of missionaries in Africa. And they founded these churches, and so these, the African churches were really in line with the Church of Norway, 
the kind of more liberal side of world Lutheranism. And recently, like because the Church of Norway has basically done everything that the ELCA does, you know, just the liberal side of everything. And um, by the way, so what's the difference between conservative and liberal? Like the terms in them, in and of themselves, are not. They don't like equate with good and evil, uh, but you know, more, more like piety and rationalism. <laughs> so, conservatism, like it's just the idea that what we've got is really good, and we kind of want to, we kind of want to like keep this, okay? And the liberal side of things says, well, you know, we're just, we're always going to kind of things are open for discussion, and we're going to change things and. So, you know, the Constitution, you know, we change stuff, you know. Second Amendment, we can take it away. And conservatives say, well, actually, this is worth conserving, right, taking care of. And so the liberal side of the church, they kind of are up for saying, hey, let's just change everything. We can change stuff, of course. Um, the United Church of Christ, uh, their, like, their motto, their slogan is, God is still speaking. And so you'll see on their churches, I don't know if we have any of them here, but... Um, in some parts of the country, you have a lot of them. They'll have these banners outside there, and a comma is like their official logo. So, a comma. We, well, we would say, well, you're darn right, there's a period there. All right, God has spoken, is what we would say. We say he's still speaking. And he speaks through conventions where we decide by vote that uh, there's no such thing as sexual sin anymore. And that every sexual desire that God gives you is actually a gift. It's like, right, okay, this is bad, okay. So, what, 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 are, what is... The United Church of Christ, um, they're basically Protestant, vague Protestants. Um, I hear their name real often, and I, I've never had a real clear definition of what... A bunch of drunk Presbyterians. <laughs> Yeah, it used to be called the Evangelical and Reformed Church. So, and then they got together with like some other denomination. I don't know. But, um, yeah, so it's a good thing to have these, these uh, conferences together, too, because when you have... Um, so the Wisconsin Synod is small. The Evangelical Lutheran Synod is small. Okay. Um, we're big. So, look, if they get together with us, then they can do more cool stuff, too. All right? Um, it's just, it's, it's a really nice thing to have. Um, what, what small? Church of Lutheran Confession. Right, so that is a well, split off from, from the Wisconsin Synod. Yeah. And, well, I'm like my... Because they weren't conservative enough. Right. Uh, you know, and so my, my in-law's church is a part of a, it's not a denomination, but they're a part of a church body that has like 12 churches. And... Who knows how they would get another pastor? I don't know. Um, oh, didn't yes, I have been there. That's the drink my best friend out there again. All right. St. John's in Tosa? What? Wauwatosa? Oh, this is in Milwaukee. Wauwatosa, Milwaukee, the lines are very blurry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, great. So, um, what, what is our English Senate? Where, where does that come Pennsylvania from? was the English Senate. The start of it? Well, the, the English district? Yeah. So the English the district English and the Slovak district, they were just, they were, because we were only German for so long that they, they were English speaking Lutherans and they had their own synod mm -hmm. and so did the Slovaks. And, um, and so eventually they just like absorbed into the Missouri Senate. But they're both conservative. Too, so oh yeah, I mean they're a part of us now, but yeah. Uh, fin finish for that way. So, um, right. So what we're seeing now is that we're we're moving out of the of the log cabin. Remember, I showed you that picture of the first seminary of the log cabin, just tiny little log cabin, one room thing, and uh, so and we're moving into a place where we're actually an established church. Okay, this is uh, Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. And uh, the first building that they build there, right? So if you're able, if your church body is able to build stuff like this, I mean, you're growing a lot, okay?
okay? And this place is putting up pastors like crazy, and they're going out, and uh, the churches are just thriving. Uh, this, is the, this was our seminary in Springfield. So we've always had two seminaries. What happened to Milwaukee? Milwaukee had a seminary. Um, Milwaukee was never a seminary. It was a prep school. So we had a system where pastors would, like, basically, you would, like, it's almost like Samuel leaving Samuel, or, uh, yeah, leaving Samuel in the temple when he's a little boy, and then he grows up and becomes a priest. It's almost like that. You send off your kid to the prep school when he's, did your dad do this at all? These two, I don't know. You still meet a lot of pastors who did this. My dad went to Michigan Lutheran Seminary. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, and so they go to these uh, prep schools. You send them off when they're in, like, ninth grade, and, and then, like, we squeeze them into, like, perfect Lutherans and, and, uh, Kevin? Do you want to be squeezed into being a perfect Lutheran? Yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> you do. But yeah, so we have the system where we'd send them all. But basically, it's two seminaries. Really good. They're both super old. Um, uh, they kind of started for different reasons. But uh, yeah, so we had two seminaries. Really nice mm-hmm. buildings. I mean, we're not living in tents anymore. All right? And this is... Uh, and again, I think this really kind of mirrors what's going on in the country, too, because the country has kind of found out who it is. And uh, we're becoming very, very, very established. We're drawing the lines, all right? Now, an interesting thing that we do in the Missouri Synod, whenever we go and start a church somewhere, for a long time, they also started schools. So you had churches and schools right next to each other for a long time. This is what we did. And it's actually a unique thing for us. Um, so the ELCA, they really didn't do this thing where they had schools attached to their churches. Um, that is our thing. Uh, I don't know the numbers anymore, but... Uh, Catholics do that too, though, right? Catholics do it too, yeah. Nope. Among Protestants, we're unique for that. You're not finding a whole lot of Presbyterian schools. They exist. They're not that old. Um, yeah, this, you don't, like, you never have a Methodist high school. You never see a Methodist elementary school. But you have Lutheran schools all over the place, okay? Um, yeah, and that's, that's what we do. Uh, the Orthodox do this too, and the Jews. And so it's a, there's a lot of different ways to do it. So Mormons, what do Mormons do? Well, uh, they just build something right next to the school, and then the kids get released. They have to. Uh, state laws. There's like I don't know if it is in Alaska. I would bet it is, but in North Carolina, where uh, the kids, you could actually get the kids out of school to do religious education. No one takes advantage of this because it's like probably a pain, and the kids would be embarrassed. But yeah, the Mormons are very good at this. They had, um, they had to go to their place before school. Yeah, oh, yes. I know. Ours was at night on Wednesdays. Because I went to Lutheran High School, but was getting confirmed Catholic. <laughs> so. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I had that too, so. Um, yeah. So, eight minutes left, okay. So, uh, Starting in 1914, this crazy thing happens it's called World War One. So, who is the world fighting? Who are the bad guys in World War One? Oh, Germans. Let's be the Germans. The Germans. Okay. So, what language are we using in our German. churches and schools? German. Uh oh. I mean, it's it's kind of the same thing as everyone being suspicious. If you're on a plane and people are speaking Arabic and wearing, you know, burqas, everyone's kind of like, uh oh. You know. Be honest, if they're speaking any sort of Eastern Oh, sure. Language. Exactly. Yeah. Like, uh, I'm in a cultural class right now in school, and um, we watched a movie and there were Persians and they were speaking oh. Farsi, but they were assumed to be 
correct. Yeah, exactly. So if you hear anyone jabbering along in some language you don't understand that's not Asian, an Asian language, or European, yeah, immediately you're kind of like, uh-oh, what's going on here, you know? And so, and this is exactly what was going on with, uh, with, uh, with the Germans in America. So, what we start doing, now this is, a, this is the hymnal, this is the hymnal that we used. Look at that. This, is a, this was the hymnal. Um, I'll pass this around. It's, it's really neat. There's about 500 hymns in it. Um, all in German. No music. No music. Okay, there's no music in it. Um, it also contains the Augsburg Confession. That's kind of cool. But, so uh, CFW Walter put this hymnal together. Um, so there's a funny thing that happens, though. Is all of a sudden, if you're using German stuff all the time in your church and your school, and then all of a sudden we're fighting the Germans and people are like, suspicious of the Germans, what are the German-speaking people going to start doing? Speaking English. Speaking English, yeah. And so we get rid of German, and this is kind of a gradual process um, that is really... Uh, now, German had a... It was, at one time, uh, the second most spoken language in the country. Um, it didn't, it by, didn't happen. By but, one vote, it only missed being the official language. Yeah, and so what... And this vote was actually requiring that all, um, anything from the government also be translated in German. So it would be in English and German. And it didn't pass, but um, it would be like, you know, Canada. Canada. So we'd be the, we would be the French people of this country, I guess. But, uh, I don't know. Anyways, so this is a big deal. Um, suspicious of Germans. So th this is, uh, it's a widespread thing, anti-German sentiment. Uh, so the one on the left is a, an actual poster that is like put around, don't speak the enemy's language. Oh, uh, but, but uh, you know. That wouldn't have flown in the Revolutionary War. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, so, but our enemy here is, uh, you know. The CLU would sue you if they seen something like that on the wall today. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, speak American, I know. I like it too. But uh, So, yeah, don't speak German. And this, the other one is from, uh, from England. But still, it's like, this is all over the place. Uh, and it would be very tough to be a German immigrant, you know, but, and everyone's thinking like, oh, but that's just, uh, mein Grossmutter, you know, she's not, she's not a, she's not a soldier for Germany, we're just living here, but it must be very, it must have been very hard for them, because they still had tons of family back there, okay, and, uh, we're declared to be the enemies, so, um, my dad's family came over because they didn't want to fight for her, oh, well, that's so interesting. They, uh, they came over and no one spoke any English, and so my grandma was pretty. Yeah, what would you do? The teachers wouldn't teach her in school. Right. It actually, in states, um, where did they, did they move to Wyoming? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if Wyoming was one of them, but several states passed laws that you were not allowed to speak anything but German in the schools. Mm -hmm. And, anything but German? Uh, anything but English, sorry. So they were outlawing the speaking of other languages in schools. And something like 12 states passed these laws. And that's, that's pretty rough. Because you have these poor kids. They don't care about the Kaiser. Yeah. Um, so, 1917. What happens in 1917? So... 1917 is when the United States enters uh, World War I, okay? And, uh, and so these are, this is a propaganda poster that's put up in order to recruit people. Uh, so the, this gorilla, uh, this monster, he's wearing a German army helmet. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that's how they're referring to Germans. And uh, the bat that he's carrying says, culture on it. So, 
He's saying this is this is what German culture is. They're savages. Okay. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of propaganda of uh, German soldiers bayoneting babies during this time too. Give me twelve more. Thank you. Um, 1917, there's also something else that happens that's very interesting. For the first time, the Missouri Senate has two million people. So we've grown to the point of having two million people, which is basically where we're at today. We just like, eh, slid, slid back, backslid. Um, but the Book of Concord is published in 1917. which is the 400th anniversary of the Reformation. So they published the Book of Concord uh, in English, Latin, and German. And this is the Concordia Triglata. Um, and so it, it kind of shows this thing where we are growing. Now this is, from the introduction to this, this is cool. From the introduction to this Book of Concord that was published in 1917, <coughs> it says, wherever the Lutheran Church has ignored her confessions or rejected all or some of them, there she always fell an easy prey to her enemies. <laughs> but wherever she held fast to her God-given crown, esteemed and studied her confessions, and actually made them a norm and standard of her whole entire life and practice, there the Lutheran Church flourished and confounded all her enemies. So, uh, and that's what we're trying to do in 1917 still, is be this church that is coming out of um, speaking German trying to remain Lutheran, which is, most of these hymns were not translated into English. Uh, okay, so 1921, we put out this hymnal, I think 21, ah, it's earlier than that, but uh, we put out this English hymnal, and so we end up having to borrow a ton of hymns uh, from other churches, okay? Now, uh, we'll, we'll close real quick. Uh, I think as far as I was trying to get, we didn't get to World War II yet, but um, so here's what Walther writes about this sort of thing, about, about where you get your hymns from. It matters where you get your hymns from and who wrote them. So someone wrote Walther and they asked him, hey, um, can I use... Uh, Methodist hymns in my Lutheran Sunday school. Are you shivering? Are you shaking over this? You're nervous. Okay. Uh, huh. He says, Our church is so rich in hymns that you could justifiably state that if one were to introduce Methodist hymns in a Lutheran school, this would be like carrying coals to Newcastle. Because Newcastle is something. The singing of such hymns would make the rich Lutheran church into a beggar that is forced to beg from a miserable sect. Go <laughs> walk now. Get away with words. I love it. Um, yeah. So very good. Uh, next week we're next week we're going to get to like the exciting stuff that prompted this whole entire class, which was tell us about Seminex. So, if you want to know what happened in the 60s and 70s, and with the split, and where the ELCA comes from, and uh, the walkout, and all dramatic stuff like this, this is next week. So, all right, let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give thanks that you've called us into a fellowship that uh, takes your doctrine seriously. We rejoice in the great confession uh, that we have given, uh, that we have been given through your word and through uh, these wonderful confessions. We pray that we would ever hold fast to this and that you would keep us steadfast in your word. We pray it's in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 The 1961, is that the Price Brothers?